Hello, my friends, and hello to Mr. Brad, who's back from... Well, we haven't made a video since before all the craziness happened. Yep. But we are here in the Wachong Reservation, checking out the deserted vis village of Feltville. And, I don't know, I've always heard, like, stories about this place growing up. I don't know if you did, because you didn't really grow up around here, right? Not around here, but through Weird New Jersey. Right, so that's the thing that really catapulted its popularity but we're here to check it out finally and it seems like it's gotten through uh it's gotten a lot of love in recent years but anyway i invite you to come along let's check out the deserted village of feltville all right so just up ahead is the parking lot and you walk down this trail here and the first building that you will see is this lovely renovated building which i believe is actually occupied given the cars that are around here and I think it's like the director of the Parks and Recs responsible for maintenance and stuff. So they've chosen actually, this is a private residence. It's clearly marked as such, so don't mess with it. Uh, I don't know when it was actually renovated and people started living here, but it was not too long ago, maybe in the last five years. Then just down the trail here, this is the second and I believe only other renovated building. And that is what used to be back in the day, the general store, the second floor accommodated a church and you can kind of see on the back of the building i don't know if there was a bell that they used to ring or something if that was like a little mini bell tower up there but um, the important thing to know as we get closer to this building is that once feltville kind of fell apart um, the business that they had for founding it wasn't doing so well somebody else brought the property and tried to repurpose all the buildings to kind of make it into like a mountain lodge and that's why you're going to see this adirondack style like porches that wrap around and the, these types of banisters here so why were people even living here you might wonder well back in like the 1700s there was somebody who decided to build a paper mill here make some paper use some of the water here i don't know if that structure actually exists but after that while the mill was still standing and that person who bought the mill had deceased some other person, I believe, felt, I don't know names right now, but I'll bring it back up later and then remind you, but an, it was bought again, and a paper mill, like, paper making and printing operation was developed here, and so in order to kind of keep everybody on the property, they, the owner of everything, built houses, built the church, built the general store, everything. It was all nicely self-contained away from the city, away from urbanization. And that lasted until about 1860 or so. Then sometime in the late 1800s, maybe 1880s, that's when another business developer came in and tried to turn it into a mountain resort. Unfortunately, by then, that's when we got a lot more of that leisure time that uh, I hear so much about changed everything back in the day, where modes of transportation started changing and people had access to a lot more. That was, you know, trolley cars, people moving into cities for their jobs. And then, especially, early 1900s was when the automobile came out. The Jersey Shore became popular, and mountain lodges weren't doing so well. And so that all kind of coupled together. This just fell by the wayside until, I believe, 1916, when it was bought by the state. This reminds me of stuff that I've seen, like, in upstate New York and Connecticut, the style of architecture. Maybe just a New England vibe in general, the type of architecture we see here. All right, just to backtrack real quick and give you some names for these, for these gentlemen who developed some of the land here. So first up was Peter Wilcox, who was the one who built the mill here. Then in the 1800s, 1860s, that's when David Felt, whose Feltville is named after, that's when he decided to build a town to support the mill operation and I guess printing operation too. I'm pretty sure they produced books here. And when he retired, everything kind of fell apart apparently. And that's when the whole mountain resort thing was attempted and failed. So we're just not too far away from that house, but even still, it just changes real quickly. This is more just, you know, na nature hiking trail type of thing. It opens up real quick, but we're trying to follow this sign to the cemetery that's back here. Just a word of advice though, if you do come out here to visit, you're going to want to bring some decent shoes because, yeah, terrain is kind of wacky, can get pretty muddy as well. So we made it up here to the 
Cemetery, which is about Peters Hill, and it was a colonial settlement apparently a hundred years before Feltville. I didn't know that was a thing, but judging by the dates on all of these grave markers, yeah, these look like, well, given the, um, you, you clearly see the American flags here, these are veterans of the Revolutionary War, interestingly enough, and then I'm not sure what NSDAR stands for, but somebody else who died in on the same date Phoebe Bagley Bad Badgley Wilcox November 22nd is that the same day John Wilcox died it it appears to be so so yeah sure enough if we zoom in on his tombstone that's the same date how curious and then this next to it is the original tombstone so from the graveyard, we backtracked here and came further along the trail here. They do have some signs posted here that tell you a little bit more if you really want to go in depth. But something that caught my eye over here is something left over from when they tried to do the mountain resort thing. So a little down this trail here, there is a big old sign that indicates that this is where there were once tennis courts, which is kind of wild. So there it is. How inviting, this poor dilapidated tennis sign. And I'm guessing that's when it was a resort. They tried to add tennis, which is it back there? Is that a tennis field? Because I don't think there were tennis courts back then. It was just really well manicured grass. Just beyond the signs on the tennis court, back on the main trail here, this looks like it was the site of Felt's summer house, if what I read is true. Some people thought that he had bit, like a big mansion up on the on a bluff overlooking his little town, but no, I think he had a summer house here, like a little small house, and this is the dig site basically for that. So we were able to come here on the back side of where the tennis court sign was. I guess you could have actually walked through that, although it looked a little overgrown. But they have the two posts, one behind those benches over there, and then one right here. I think these look a little more modern than supposedly when this whole thing was happening. But there it is. So this is where the net was, and then the court was situated somewhere around here. So here is a little sign that gives me numbers of people that actually lived here. So 172 people at its peak were documented to have lived in Feltville. And they did all sorts of things here. I see a blacksmith, there's a bunch of wanted ads here, farm laborer, a bookbinder, Protestant women wanted, not sure about that one, a good printer, good job printer wanted, and then a steward to take charge of the farming department. And then up here, the child labor, oh good old child labor, children as young as five were employed in the factories and tenement sweatshops. <laughs> Looks like we're here at the Feltville Historic District and this whole thing is currently fenced off and so we cannot get any closer but you can see that just like the houses that we saw previously they've added kind of that Adirondack stuff for the mountain lodge it once attempted to be but then the construction of the actual house there is very much in line with that old school like 1860s type of vibe so here it goes into a little detail about Glenside Park, which is the mountain lodge that I kept referring to. It's uh, something that was very common back like post-Civil War, where there was lakeside lodges in the Adirondack Mountains and all of that stuff being built. It was sort of the Victorian America age that they refer to it as the Gilded Age. So that is a thing. I actually have been to one much grander that is up in Lake George or Lake Champlain. So I'm looking for a full name of this guy. They're saying just Ackerman. Here it is. In 1882, Warren Ackerman of Scotch Plains purchased Feltville and turned it into Glenside Park. Then he died in 1893 and the resort continued operations until 1916 and then it was sold. Just another house here, but interestingly enough, there is a mailbox. This looks a little fresher and more brand new than this. Were people actually living here? Actually, that reminds me of something. One thing I found out is that from the Great Depression all the way up to the 60s, I believe, that they put people in here, residents, people to live here, 
just as a measure of helping with the amount of strife, economic strife that was going on and people that were homeless. So yeah, there, there have been people living here at least since the 60s and maybe like into the early 70s. There weren't people around if we knew this wasn't getting all preserved and stuff. This would look sufficiently spooky. I wonder what kind of stories are told here. I'm making our way down the trail a little bit longer, or down this road, to Masker's Barn, whatever that is. I think that might be an event space now. Just shows you uh, how everything is getting repurposed here, even the deserted village. But uh, what are your thoughts so far exploring here? Oh no, it's awesome. This is totally awesome. It's, it's very interesting to see all of these old buildings and finding out what the history is behind them and knowing that there's a little bit of a creep factor to them as well. Love it. All right, we're further down this way, yeah, there is some stuff that looks like straight from a horror movie. Holy smokes, this stuff is just run down. I'm almost afraid to go near it, but it looks like you actually can. I don't know. Should we go near this stuff? Yeah. I mean, it's not saying we can't. Yeah. So just to give you an idea here, this is probably what the other houses looked like before they added porches and all of that stuff. Or maybe this is not knowing too much about construction here. Uh, it might not be the case, but it is interesting, though, that it does just kind of sit right on top there. I don't see any sign of a foundation or anything like that. But yeah, these, these poor buildings have seen better days. I couldn't imagine living out here, though. Yeah, so far this might be the creepiest one. That's that's some good stuff right there. You could do a fun photo shoot here. But ghosts? I don't think we're going to see many ghosts or, or feel anything. Huh. Alright, so this one doesn't even have a, some any sort of porch. Maybe it fell apart. I think I see stuff indicating that there was something on there at one point. And now it's very much gone. I do like, though, that you could chill on the porch and even in midday you would be in the, in the shade. Because, you know, right now it's like noon. So that's good design that they designed it in, with the uh, sun in mind. And the back of the house is what the sun would be beating on. So just up ahead, which is just a couple of feet away from the abandoned houses there, is this barn, which is now converted into an event space because everyone loves their barn weddings these days. So <laughs> I'm going to just chill here, turn around, but it's back here. I don't believe this is part of the deserted village, but... There it is. So back behind those first two houses that we came upon after uh, going through the tennis courts and all that stuff, there's this that's just been cordoned off. I guess it's experiencing some heavy restoration work, but there is stuff growing out of the roof. And wow, this is this is pretty intense. It looks like a lot of the foundations and stuff back there, there there's no porch or anything. I wonder how far down we can go here. Because there was one cool thing that I saw in another video where you could look through a window and see this really elaborately painted mural for some reason. But unfortunately, that's not what we're going to see. We just see poor building in a poor state. And there's like nothing peeking out in the windows. This is just not the scariest. It must have been pretty cool though back in the day to have this type of view. Just, wow. Because right there is the porch. And you just get this nice, crazy nature view. All the way down there, I hear people walking the trails. This is big. This reservation is huge. I think the mill is like a mile to a mile and a half like away. It's crazy. This was something like 500 to 600 acres that were owned by Feltville. Or by Felt. So one thing that I did forget to mention is why this is called a deserted village. That was actually because somebody in the newspaper, I think in the late 1800s, early 1900s, some journalist from Boston was trying to, you know, create some back then, back then what was clickbait. And yeah, <laughs> the deserted village came to be essentially just by manufacturing some things to really intrigue the reader and stuff that these types of places existed and why was it abandoned? Oh no. But yeah, it's just business ventures gone wrong. All right, so that kind of wraps it up on checking out most of this. There is a mill that's pretty far away from here, pretty far walk. We we'll probably have to like find another parking spot and stuff. Uh, but so that's all the historically accurate stuff. And you had mentioned that you heard about this place from weird New Jersey. Yes. What kind of stuff did you hear? I'm curious. Um, there was, it was not like a, like you hear most ghost stories where they saw like, you know, apparitions and whatnot. It was more along the lines of the creep factor of coming here. Sometimes people 
thought they did hear uh, sounds of like women screaming um, or children screaming. I believe I'd read somewhere in one of the articles as well. Uh, a lot of the stories that I heard was basically when they came here, they got the get the hell out of here vibe to them. Mm. So they would kind of like either take off or they would, you know, be brave and risk it. But um, I can see it. I mean, even during the day, like aside from the fact that there are other people uh, here as well, I can see that this being a very creepy place uh, coming to you at night. And uh, you, you know, would actually come here at night? Yes, I would with a group of people. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not brave enough to do that alone. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd be more afraid of like some other crazy person. But you'd be in good company because you're crazy. <laughs> the I'll stuff that it. I heard growing up was to like stay away. Not from the deserted village, but from this area in general at night as a kid. Because it was apparently, and I don't know how much of this is true, maybe it's completely false, but there was like Satanists or witch covens, there was rituals in the woods happening. And it all started when I was working around Scotch Plains, and I was told to like avoid being invited and going out with like certain people that look certain ways because they want to take you into the woods and sacrifice you and stuff like that. Don't know how true that was, <laughs> but apparently this, there's this area, not marked anywhere, called the Enchanted Forest, where a lot of that stuff ha go, happened, supposedly, and where you get those weird type of vibes. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure where that is located, so... Mm. Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, the other thing that I've been told about is that some girls drowned in the area where the mill was, the first mill, so there was a mill pond, and I think one or two girls drowned in there, so supposedly they're wandering around. I don't know. But then the there too. was supposedly a story about a girl that was buried underneath one of the porches here, that she passed away and was buried under the porch for some reason. Uh, when they started doing their preservation and all that stuff, though, they dug all that up, and they never found any remains. The other thing I heard that kind of stinks is that that graveyard that we visited was moved. So there's just tombstones. There's nobody home there. So apparently somebody tried digging it up at one point. What these, what the people that work here have to deal with is insane. But yeah, somebody tried to dig that up, and there was nobody home. It's just moved gravestones, grave markers. The other thing that I've heard is that two girls were wandering around the woods and they disappeared and we couldn't find anything but their bonnets. Don't know if that's true either, but one thing that was worth noting is that the historians here say that they do a hayride every year during, you know, Halloween time and they don't actually have too many good ghost stories. So if you're from this area and have some stories, I would love to hear those in the comments because all I've heard is cautionary tales about, hey, don't get sacrificed to the pagans. I have no idea. But anyway, hope you enjoyed following along. Brad, it's good to see you. Always. Hopefully we'll see you again real soon. The, we got to do some more weird New Jersey stuff in the near future. Yeah. But for now, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. And I hope you go make your own adventure. Bye.